Today, we will explain the parallel axis theorem, including how and when it's used. We've previously discussed the meaning of the moment of inertia. In many applications, we need this value to solve the dynamics of a rotating system. We can find the moment of inertia of particles easily enough, and we get the moment of inertia of various shapes using calculus, often when the objects are being rotated around their center of mass. But what do we do if the object is rotating around a point other than its center of mass? Finding its moment of inertia in such a case is sometimes possible with the same methods of calculus used before. However, sometimes this approach is unwieldy or even impossible. That is where the parallel axis theorem comes in. The parallel axis theorem states that if we have the moment of inertia of an object about its center of mass, then we can easily find its moment of inertia relative to any rotational axis parallel to the original. As the name suggests, the new rotational axis must be parallel to the one through the center of mass, which we already have. If the new axis is not parallel, we must resort to other methods. Objects often naturally rotate about their center of mass, but there are many real-life examples of off-center rotations, including doors or arms and legs. Also, many systems rotate around their center of mass, but are comprised of off-center rotating objects, such as the blades of a fan. So, how do we use this theorem? The formula is quite simple. The new moment of inertia equals the moment about the center of mass plus the product of the object's mass m and the distance d between the old and new axes. With such a simple calculation, we can see that using this method is not only sometimes necessary, but it's also often easier than the alternative direct computation. A derivation of the theorem will be linked in the description below. We'll discuss some implications of the theorem, but first, let's use it in some examples. As we've seen before, a disk's moment of inertia about its center is one half of the mass times the square of the radius. If we instead rotate it about a point on the end, we can find this new moment of inertia with the parallel axis theorem. We take the original moment of inertia and add the disk's mass times the distance d the axis has moved. That distance is the disk's radius. So, the new moment is 3 halves times mr squared. That's three times higher than the original. We can easily do the same procedure for a hoop. And we get two mr squared, twice the original. For a sphere, we get 7 fifths mr squared. Now, for a rod about its center, we start with the original 1 twelfth ml squared, where l is the rod's length. If we move the axis to its end, we move it a distance of 1 half of l. Putting this into the formula, We square L over 2, yielding ML squared over 4. Adding this to the original simplifies to 1 third ML squared, just as we get with the calculus derivation. We're not limited to just rotating things on their edges. They can be rotated anywhere in between.
They can even be rotated about an axis outside of the object entirely. This can be achieved if there's something holding onto them to make them rotate about that axis. We just need the mass of the object and the distance from the center of mass to the new axis. Remember that when we have multiple objects rotating together, that we can add together their individual moments of inertia to get the total once we adjust for the new axis. Take, for example, the pendulum of a grandfather clock. We can imagine it as a disc along with a rod. The rod is rotated around its end and the disc is far away from the axis. This will become more relevant when we study the motion of a compound pendulum. There will be some more notable examples to come, but first, let's discuss some of the implications of the theorem thus far. In all of the examples we saw, the new moment of inertia was strictly greater than the moment of inertia about the center of mass. In fact, the formula of the theorem shows that the new moment can only ever increase. It will always be greater. From this, we can conclude that an object's lowest moment of inertia will always be through its center of mass. We've noted before that the moment of inertia of a particle is md squared. But what exactly constitutes a particle? In most cases, such particles are really small spheres or other shapes. So what happens if we treat them as such? Let's say we rotate a one kilogram sphere of radius 10 centimeters, one meter away from the axis by a light string. Let's assume that the string is light enough to ignore. The sphere has a moment of inertia of 0.004 kilogram meter squared about its center. The added factor from the parallel axis theorem is one kilogram meter squared giving us a total new moment of 1.004 kilogram meter squared. This value is nearly one. Because the sphere was small compared to its distance from the axis, the added factor from the theorem is much greater than the original amount. So, in such a case, we could simply use the factor from the theorem and ignore the original. This leaves us with a moment of inertia of only md squared, which is exactly the moment of a small particle. Overall, we can say that if an object is quite small compared to its distance from the axis of rotation, we can treat it as a particle. We can also see how to find moments of inertia subtractively. For example, let's say we needed the moment of inertia of this shape. How would we find it? We know we can add moments of inertia, so if we added this shape to disks that filled the holes, we would have a larger disk. The original shape, plus the disks, equals a larger disk. So, the large disk, minus the smaller disks, will leave us with the desired result. We can get the moments of inertia of the smaller disks with the parallel axis theorem, and solve from there. These have just been a few of the basic examples of applying the parallel axis theorem. But infinitely more can be crafted out of combinations of the demonstrations and principles we've seen so far. With the parallel axis theorem, we're equipped to analyze the moment of inertia of all sorts of systems, from the mundane to the advanced.